Good morning. I just want to say I felt this spirit really come on me this morning. And I just want to encourage anybody, don't be afraid, because he's there for each and every one of us. So, you know, if you feel it, show it, send it to everybody. Okay, thank you. Right, the reading is, as um, Glyn said, from John 1, and it's on page 1063 in the Church Bibles, okay? John 1, verse 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world has, was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human descent, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Joy. Now Juliet's going to come and lead us in our intercessions for this morning. If you, when you pass um, Bushmead Court and Castle Troy, uh, to, to pray for those uh, places, because um, there are some folk who are unable uh, to come and join us here. I know, we know there are some who do from Bushmead Court. Um, but there is ministry going on in those places. Anne and I go to, particularly to Castle Troy on a regular basis, but also to Bushmead Court. Please pray, because I think the Lord is uh, impacting not just those who live there, but the staff who serve there. So you might like to pray for those communities. Let's pray for Helen now. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the time that Helen has spent preparing this uh, today. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us hearts open to hear you. Lord, we ask that you will inspire and guide her words today in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. It's good to be here this morning and thank you, Joy, for reading the passage for us today. Am I echoing like mad over here? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a really familiar passage, isn't it? I'm not going to be able to cover all of it this morning because it's just such a rich passage. So I'd encourage you to, to go home and perhaps have a look at the bits that I might miss out. It's a passage that's normally included in a traditional carol service. And in fact, I read it at our carol service here back in December. It's a difficult passage to read, so well done, Joy. And it's an even harder one to understand, and especially if you're somebody that only comes to church at Christmas. People love to hear the familiar words, but how many people really understand what they mean? Now, there are a couple of famous Johns in the Bible. One is Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. But the author of this book is Jesus' friend, John. He's the brother of James, and they were the sons of Zebedee, fishermen and sometimes known as the sons of thunder. John was very close to Jesus. He was one of the inner group of the disciples. And there is much in John's gospel that covers what Jesus taught, and perhaps more significantly, what he prayed, indicating that perhaps John was the one that Jesus was closest to. John also wrote the letters known as 1, 2, and 3 John and the book of Revelation. And it's thought that he wrote this gospel to the Jews who were living abroad. 
Our verses today form what is known as the prologue. They're the words that come before the main part of John's gospel, where he describes what Jesus says and does. And it's as if John is setting out his stall from the beginning. No messing about. He states who Jesus is, and then he goes on to prove it. The other gospels are very slightly different in that they tend to describe what Jesus said and did, leading the readers to draw their conclusions as as it goes through the gospel until perhaps the last few pages. And opinion is divided as to whether this is a good book to give to a nearly or or a nearly new Christian. I've heard people say, whatever you do, don't give them John, it's too difficult. Start with Mark. While others say that John is the best one to give, and it most fully describes who Jesus is. I'll leave it to you to decide, should you ever get the opportunity. So let's look at our passage. The passage starts with, in the beginning... And in the words of Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, that's a very good place to start. It says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. Now, we probably know who or what the term word is referring to. It's Jesus, as John explains at the end of today's passage. But why does John use the term word, translated logos in the Greek? To the Jews at the time, God's word was more than something merely written down or spoken about. It was something active, so that when God expressed his will, that will was carried out. God spoke, and it was done. Isaiah 55.11 says, It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. And in Deuteronomy 32, it says, When Moses had finished reciting all these words to the people of Israel, he added, Take to heart all the words of warning I have given you today. Pass them on as a command to your children, so they will obey every word of these instructions. These instructions are not empty words. They are your life. We can see this clearly at the beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning of Genesis, where by his active word, God created the universe. To the people of the time, God's word had such life and power that they thought of it almost as if it were a person. And this is the sense John is trying to get across in the first few verses of his gospel. The word existed before creation and the means by which God created. By writing like this, he's laying the groundwork, reminding his readers that there is a source of life that is distinct from God, but still a part of the creator God and God himself before delivering what would have been for them the knockout blow, identifying in verse 14 that this word, this instigator of creation, this part of God is Jesus. It says in verse 14, So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. See, for us, it's easier to see in hindsight, but at the time, this would have been revolutionary. One commentator writes, in one short, shattering expression, John unveils the great idea at the heart of Christianity, that the very word of God took flesh for man's salvation. This theme is taken up after Jesus' death and resurrection by the Apostle Paul, And Glyn actually used this at the beginning of of our service this morning as he speaks to the church at Colossae, and he speaks to us as well. And I'll repeat it. It says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Both John's and Paul's descriptions of Jesus are just mind-blowing, aren't they? And it's worth spending some time just meditating on these verses to get a true perspective of just who he is. We can sometimes bring him down to earth a bit, making him our sort of cozy companion. And it's easy to miss some things in a familiar passage. Did you realize, for example, that all things have been created through him and for him? 
You have been created for Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. Perhaps in your groups this week, you can spend some time just looking at these verses as part of your worship. I want to move on now to the central portion of today's passage, starting with verse 4. It says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. And John now begins to talk about Jesus in connection with light. And it's a theme he returns to later in the book, and in his later letter of 1 John. In his Gospel, he writes in, in John 8, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And again, this would have been a familiar theme to his contemporary readers. They were expecting a Messiah who would be a light for the Jews and also a light for the Gentiles. In Isaiah 42, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. And later, Paul says in Acts 26, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and the Gentiles. But what does this theme of light mean for us here today, reading this passage this morning in Christchurch? So I want to take four aspects of light which are familiar to us today. Firstly, what happens when Jesus shines his light on our lives? Over Christmas, we were expecting some family members to come and stay. I'd made up the beds planned the meals, bought the food, cleaned the bathroom, sound familiar to the ladies, and all was ready. And then the sun came out, and the windows looked filthy, there was a thick layer of dust on our furniture, and it looked like someone had trampled grass clippings all over our dark wood floor. I had to get the duster out and do some more work. You see, light shows up the dirt, and Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, shines his light into our lives. This was demonstrated really clearly to us when Brenda and I first started going to church. We'd sit in the pew, and the vicar, who hardly knew us, regularly gave sermons which made us feel very uncomfortable. Our thoughts were, who is this guy? How does he know? But of course he didn't. But Jesus did, and was gently shining his light onto the areas of our lives that needed some attention. Graciously, there was no condemnation, just an invitation to change. And with his help, we began the process of becoming more like Jesus. And we've still got a long way to go. In Ephesians 5, it says, For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Secondly, light acts as a guide. Now, if you're one to get up in the middle of the night, and I don't, I don't want to know, you're probably okay not to switch on a light in your own home. But if you're staying away, you really have to do something to stop you crashing about and waking up your hosts. Personally, I use a mobile phone, not a flashy iPhone with a torch, but it's amazing how that dim light bursts into the darkness and shows me the way. In the same way, Jesus guides us if we will let him. His light shows us the way, helping us to make the right decisions, or keeping us out of danger. And he does this in a number of ways, but mainly by that quiet whisper of the Holy Spirit to our spirits. Isaiah 30 says, Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. And of course, by his word to us in the Bible, that familiar passage in Psalm 119 describes it beautifully. Your word is a lamp for my feet a light on my path. Thirdly, light reveals in the sense of throwing light on the subject. Bob, Bob, you uh, described it a couple of weeks ago as a light bulb moment. And this is one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. Later in John's Gospel, it says, the helper will come, the Spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. 
I know many of you have experienced that moment when you're reading a familiar passage in the Bible and it suddenly makes sense. Now I understand. You see something you haven't seen before, perhaps understanding a new aspect of God's love or purposes. I don't know about you, but I find that really exciting. Fourthly, um, and lastly, light dispels fear. Many children have night lights so that if they wake in the night, they can see familiar things. And if they have a nightmare, you normally switch on a light to make things normal again. And it's the same for adults. We generally don't go walking about in the pitch black. You can start to imagine all sorts of things, hear things that aren't there or are there. Even a little bit of light pierces the darkness. I've just got Brendan's keys here. He's got a light on his key ring. It's really quite pathetic. <laughs> until he's looking... <laughs> I didn't say you were pathetic. <laughs> um, until he's finished street pastoring and he's looking for the, the lock in his car when it's in the car park, when it actually dispels the darkness. It's no longer dark and he can see... And I think uh, it's the same with our spiritual lives. If we keep our eyes fixed on the light of Jesus, we needn't be afraid. We won't be overcome by the prince of darkness. It says the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Just a little bit of light pierces the darkness. You see, it's no longer dark. If you put a little bit of light on, it's no longer dark. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, the powers of darkness have to flee. But we do, however, have to invite Jesus into the situation. We have to ask for his help. We need to switch the light on. If we hear the voice of the father of lies telling us how rubbish we are, we need to invite the Holy Spirit to remind us what Jesus thinks of us. And when Jesus comes into a situation where we are facing temptation or attack from the enemy, he changes things. And this is especially true with spiritual warfare. And as the old song goes, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Now sadly, the people of Jesus' time mostly didn't recognize the light amongst them. Verse 10 of our reading says, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. And it's the same today. Many people have heard about Jesus have dabbled with submitting to him, or have even met him, but they prefer to live in the darkness. It's too scary to allow him to shine his light into their lives. They are afraid of what might be found. They might have to give up something or someone. But what about you? Chris, can you just pop those slides up just to summarize? What about me this morning? What does it mean for us this morning? Will you allow Jesus to shine his light to reveal the dirt in your life? It's probably not a matter of multi-million pound fraud. It's probably more about the little things, your attitudes, your language, what you watch on television, punctuality, Laziness, pride, unforgiveness, the light, the list just goes on. You'll know the sort of thing. Jesus wants to make you more like him. Will you let him? Will I let him? It can take some courage, so let's be brave. Do you need him to guide you at the moment? Is there a decision to make? Can you trust Jesus with it? Why don't you try and ask him to show you the way? Are you reading your Bible and asking Jesus to reveal new things to you? And lastly, is there something causing you to fear or be anxious at the moment? Are you being tempted and finding it difficult to resist? Are you in a dark place? Let's ask Jesus to reassure us and to demonstrate his victory over the powers of darkness. My prayer for me, and for all of us here today, is that one that Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, 
who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Amen. Thank you, Helen, for bringing us that word from the Lord this morning. Will you please stand for the communion? <clears throat> 